Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Hashtag Sports, where your two favorite individuals, Paul and Mario, will be delivering you your Buffalo Bills content for today. And um, uh, just before we get into that, I just want to mention uh, all of our stuff uh, is down in the description of this video. You can find our iTunes, Spotify, and also channel memberships if you want. Uh, you can go back to our stream as well to see what the uh, channel memberships entail as well. Uh, just the biggest point about it is that 50% of that is getting donated to the Punt Foundation, and we're so happy to support that cause. So if you support us, you're actually supporting the Punt Foundation, which is a great um, charity. The other thing that we want to talk about is that Paul and I are usually on opposite sides of certain points at Hashtag Nation, as you guys know. Yeah. Uh, the Buffalo Bills, no surprise to Paul and myself, drafted two wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Well, the surprise was drafting two. I knew they were going to draft one. I didn't know they were going to draft two, which means that you have Brown and Beasley in the fold for two more years. These wide receivers that you currently have on the roster and the new ones that you just drafted could learn in the system and and develop, which is great. However, Paul likes one, I like the other. Yep. And we're going to have a little bit of a debate. It's time for the Thunderdome. <laughs> Did you touch my drum set? <laughs> <laughs> so Yeah, it's it's fun to stand on opposite sides, right? Because really these are two wide receivers that have very different skill sets. Um yes. So I'm I'm kind of excited to talk about um you know, why, you know, why they both also late in a really deep wide receiver class, um, yes. why the bills thought to grab both of them and kind of where, you know, we see this going forward. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to, to debate this because I, I do like one more than the other, but um, it's not like I dislike either pick. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah I, I see, I see the bonuses on, on each of these players. Absolutely. Uh, I just happen to like one more than the other. All right, and then uh, in order to try to break it down for Hashtag Nation, we're going to go in our Inside the Outside studio. Inside the Outside studio. I wish I could get this right. Uh, inside the hat. Inside the numbers, outside the hash. So basically what it was. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Championship, TJ Hushmazoli. Uh, <laughs> you remember that commercial? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if we take a look at Gabriel Davis, who was drafted in the fourth round, 6'2", 216, 32-inch arms, nine and a quarter hands. Uh, as you can see, his combine statistics are right there. He ran a 4.54, 4, 14 reps on the bench, 35-inch vert, 124 broad, 708 three-cone, which is pretty respectable for a guy at 6'2", and a 4.59 shuttle, which is pretty good as well. If we flip over to Hodges, he's uh, two inches taller, but uh, six pounds lighter. He's got 33-inch arms. He's a uh, nine and seven-eighths. He ran actually a 4.61, only nine on the bench, 36 and a half divert, 124 broad, 701 three cone, and a 4.12.20 shuttle. Me giving you those numbers right now, and my enthusiasm could tell you which one I like. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> that three cone. You know, you're just like, what? What are you running three cone? What are you running the 20? That's my dude. Is what? he six two or or bigger? That's my dude. It's so fascinating too because Paul, you got to think. I put a little bit of of a pref- of a perspective on this as well. So if you look at a guy who's six foot four, seven oh one three cone, four point one two shuttle. Then you look over right. at a guy at six two at a seven oh eight three cone, which is very similar, but a four five nine twenty shuttle. Yeah. So yeah. and then when you combine the fact, and I mentioned this six times already to you. Uh, Hodges had a better three cone and twenty yard shuttle than your starting running back. Who yeah. everyone marvels at his ability to shift in the hole and change direction. Right. My question about Hodges, sixth round pick. Why was he a sixth round pick? Let's, yeah, let's, I, let's try to bring that up first. So, I'm I'm always a big fan of saying like whenever you look at a guy um, and you say why did he tumble down boards? First off, you always look for injury history. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, when it's not injury history, you look for level of competition. Right. Okay. If it's not level of competition, you look for consistency across his career. Was he really just a ghost year one, two, and then all of a sudden turned it on, you know, right before he got drafted? Uh, that's usually, that, but, I mean, listen, we all, there's always the outliers, <laughs> right? Henry Ruggs. He there's ran, always, the, <laughs> not, well, they're always Raiders. I don't know why that is. He ran so a four, what? Draft him. <laughs> 
Well, you know, and what Isaiah Hodges went to what Oregon State? D one, man. Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's still D one. So so is Toledo. So, <laughs> Whatever. Northwest Missouri State. <laughs> I apologize if you went to Northwest Missouri State, but I understand what you're talking about. The level of competition they play at. Right. Pac-12, right. man. Yeah. Come on. Well, you know, it's, so let's look at look at Mountain production. West? I don't know. Look at production across. I don't know. You know I don't keep track of conferences. I love torturing like, you. Right when you start to get on a point, I give you the shiny object. But go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so how is so, his statistics? So if you take a look at statistics across the board, right? And that's, again, one of the reasons why you could start saying, why did this guy slip out? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. He was, it was Pac-12, by the way. Okay. Uh, he was uh, Oregon State's leading receiver, 59 receptions, 700 or 876 yards, 14.8 yards per reception, five TDs in 11 games on nine starts. But... Um, he in 2019 this was that was last year in 2019 uh he 13 touchdowns 13.6 per reception for 1100 yards on 86 receptions so kind of a little bit of a difference there decent production as a sophomore significantly better production as a junior right so the production is there um you know the last two seasons so a lot of times now you know now that you kind of eliminate an injury You've eliminated competition because the Pac-12 is a good conference. Um, you've eliminated production. So what is really the reason? Um, now, now you have to go to the tape, right? And I think that's where some of the fun stuff hides with Isaiah Hodges. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but like, I just, I don't, I know what his three cone is, right? But I don't see a lot of explosion off the line. And I think that's kind of where a lot of scouts at a, with the wide receivers in this class they could see a lot of power at the line or yeah. they saw a lot of explosion up the line. I don't think he gives you either. Right. So that's kind of where you start falling down boards when you don't bring either of those in this draft class to the table. Yeah. And, and, you know, there could, there could be an argument made in the fact that it was a very deep class. So mm -hmm. there are guys that could be hidden in that. Mm -hmm. Um, the interesting part about Hodges that I thought was interesting when, when you look at the scouting combine and his NFL comparison, which mm -hmm. I found very fascinating, is mm -hmm. Geronimo Allison, mm -hmm. who yeah. I I don't know if it's because he plays with Rodgers or what, but I'm a big fan of Geronimo Allison. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, I think you, in, in, a, in, a, in a way, alluded to the fact that his nine bench is probably the pop and the <laughs> the pro, the, the, what you're talking about his pressure off off of the line is his nine yeah. reps on the bench you yeah. know what i mean he doesn't have that however i don't think that you know john brown and cole beasley are throwing up 225 for seven or, or, or for 17 or 20 um those guys you know use up here and, and and they're very quick to get off the line in a slot or an outside role which is good so i think coming into this offense will probably benefit him more than it would anybody else. And, and Davis as well. I, I believe that Davis can thrive in this. The greatest part about both of these picks that I, I noticed about on draft night was number one, um, they're going to have time to learn. There's not going to be immediate pressure on these kids to learn the offense. Although they will maybe next year, they're going to be put into the limelight. If you know, listen, we drafted you. We need you to pick this up. If you're not able to pick it up, which John Brown has said many times is one of the most difficult offenses to pick up, you know, what, what do we care? They were fourth and sixth round picks. We don't care. The other thing is this. Neither of these guys came from a system that had a heralded quarterback. Now, I don't mean to insult the two quarterbacks that they had, but I didn't see those guys get drafted too high. <laughs> so they were able to still be productive players at the Division One level, albeit with subpar quarterback play so that is the most alluring thing about both of these guys why i like hodges more is because i think he'll have more to prove when he comes into camp i mean he's taller and leaner which is kind of like okay they want that big body receiver he's not really that big body receiver he's a tall guy who's very quick and he's very shifty which in this offense you need to be 
Um, I think, which the, with the comparison for uh, Davis was, he was he's more compared to Terrence Williams. Now, if you told me in this offense, which guy do you think would thrive more, Terrence Williams or Geronimo Allison? Well, I tend to lean toward Allison because I, I just like him better. So do you think that Terrence Williams would thrive more in this offense than Geronimo Allison? I mean, I like Allison better as a player, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm, but, but I've never been a big Terrence Williams fan. So no, you know, <laughs> it's not, you know, like you're not really barking up the right tree with that comparison <laughs> for me. Um, I, I think one of the, one of the fascinating things about both these guys is they both have phenomenal hands. And that was like, the thing, I don't think this team wanted to draft another Zay Jones. No offense to Zay Jones, but let's be realistic. Zay Jones let a lot of balls hit the turf that simply were catchable footballs, right? And I don't think they wanted to make that mistake again. Um, Isaiah Hodges has phenomenal hands. Phenomenal. Yes. Um, he doesn't get the best downfield separation, right? Um, and I think that's one of the things that at the pro level is going to be a bit of a struggle for him is um, he doesn't have great long speed. Um, you know, he's, you know, it, but that's, it's going to take a while for him to mature into being an NFL wide receiver. The thing that he has working towards his advantage is he's six foot four and he catches everything, right? Yes. Like he just, he's, he's, he's fly paper. He just, he's automatic. He just, he's going to catch the football. Um, Davis is a little bit different. Um, a couple things that bother me about Davis right out of the gate is um, if like I watched a game, of uh it was actually dane jackson uh who the bills drafted in the seventh round um against gabriel davis uh, for ucf and whenever i watch ucf all i could think of is Corey davis right because <laughs> limited route tree you know like that's the kind of stuff that he runs except gabriel davis was averaging like 17 yards of reception so i mean that's crazy right that is insane that is yeah, it's crazy. Insane. Yeah, 12 touchdowns, 17 yards of reception, 72 receptions. The production was there as senior season. The year before that, very similar to Isaiah Hodges, 53 receptions, uh, 815 yards, seven touchdowns. So, again, production was there. Um, a kind of, again, competition's another issue. But um, Davis takes plays off. Um, at the college level. And that was really apparent by watching him. If it was a run play, he really didn't have a whole lot of effort. Um, if the run play, if the run play was on the opposite side of the field, he, he really didn't have much interest okay. in getting involved. Okay. Um, even if the run was to his side, uh, he didn't really have much interest. His routes were pretty lackluster because UCF runs a spread system. So it's pretty predetermined whether he's going to get the ball or not. Yeah. Uh, with that being said, I saw uh, Gabriel Davis light up uh, Dean Jackson's team for like 13 receptions and 130 yards. So it's not like he wasn't a busy man. And I understand that sometimes you get a little tired, you're going to take some plays off, but it, it was pretty apparent that he, he didn't have a lot of interest in the run game. Um, but what I do like uh, about Gabriel Davis a little bit more is um, I think he creates separation better, which is the difference between a fourth round pick and a sixth round pick, right? Yes. All things remaining equal. They're both automatic catching a football but the difference is who can create the most separation. And I think Gabriel Davis is just better at that in, in the short and the long areas than Isaiah Hodges was. Um, and that's one of the things that in this offense, you need to know how to create separation. Um, if you're going to survive, you, you have to know how to create separation. You cannot work in tight windows in this offense. There's just not enough time for that. Allen's going to move right past you. If, if the coverage is a little too tight. Um, yeah. So that's why I like Gabriel Davis a little bit more, but it, it their college production is is really pretty similar although again on tape they're very different players yeah i i what i like about is the the fact that hodges can erase certain things for you with sure. with the way and maybe he has been too reluctant to rely on that throughout mm -hmm. his college career and, and that and we know right. the pros is a completely different animal the yeah. things that he was able to do at the college level that if he couldn't separate, listen, I, I can take care of this. I'm fine. Right. I can go right. up above somebody. I can do this. Mm -hmm. And you're right. He catches, he catches everything. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. where it is. Nope. The ability to track a football in the air is so underrated at the next level. It's mm -hmm. almost, I don't want to rain on your parade because you made a valid point. Creating separation in the NFL will keep you employed quite a bit. Mm-hmm. The fact is, 
his ability to track the ball and catch it and get get him, his body in position almost negates the inability to separate somewhat. And I don't want to, I, like I said, that's being able to separate. I believe is 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 one of the hallmarks of a, of a wide receiver surviving in the NFL. Mm-hmm. However, and able to erase certain things like that. I mean, I know I'm making a ridiculous example right now because he was just a freak in every facet of the game. I can't remember Calvin Johnson like really being wide open ever. Mm-hmm. But yeah. when the ball went in the air, it wasn't anybody's but his. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so right. although he didn't get amazing separation, which is probably why his career ended a lot earlier than it should have. I mean, he played a game with broken fingers and caught like eight passes. Like you're not supposed right. to do that. Right. But the, the ability of him to create the separation at the point of uh, the high point on the ball is something that I think is going to be very alluring for Buffalo Bills fans because they well, haven't seen that. And to be fair, these these two players do two things really, really, really well. Um, one, they have they really do have solid catch radius, yes. right? So they both can make a quarterback look a little bit better than they really are. Yeah. Um, you know, but they both have nearly identical arm lengths. They're both thirty two plus inch arms. So like they're, they, they both have a really large catch radius, yeah. but two, it's something Robert Foster doesn't do. And it's track a ball. You already mentioned it. Both yeah. these guys track the deep pass really, really well. Um, and that's why you see Foster struggle in this offense. Cause even when Robert Foster can create separation downfield, he's, he just doesn't see the ball great in the air. Um, and we've seen it for the last couple of seasons is one of the reasons he couldn't get on the field last season uh, was because even when he can get downfield, he just doesn't see the ball great. Uh, we saw him, you know, struggle to adjust to passes. Um, and if you have somebody like Diggs, Diggs is gonna, he he's gonna make Robert Foster uh, irrelevant, right? And Gabriel Davis and Isaiah Hodges could make Robert Foster irrelevant because they're gonna see the ball downfield better than Foster. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm not gonna complain about Robert Foster's hands. I have no reason to complain about Robert Foster's hands. Nope. But these kids catch everything. Yes, absolutely. So, now let me ask you this. Sure. You got a, you got a, you got three players here, right? You got Gabriel Davis, Isaiah Hodges, Duke Williams. You've got room for one, and you can practice squad the other. What are you doing? Hodges and Davis. Oh, you're gonna let Duke go? I'm gonna let Duke go. Okay. Why? I think. I think the draft trumps free agency. And, you know, I, I think a lot of a lot of things that the Buffalo Bills want to do is they want to keep costs down. That's mm-hmm. completely negated. And number one, they want to keep costs down. It's sure. negated with all the three of these guys because they're all making right. nothing. Right. Um, I think going out and getting a guy in free agency as a placeholder, and, mm-hmm. you know, in wrestling we call it a transitional champion. <laughs> You're just holding the title <laughs> so we can put it on somebody else. Uh, I think what these guys bring that Duke doesn't bring is youth. And while they're all very, you know, they're all very comparable, you could put Duke on the practice squad. You're going to lose him. Still can. Yeah. You still could put him on, but you're going to lose him. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody was watching that Texans game. They yeah. know that this kid's hungry and he wants to play and he wants, he wants, to, he wants to succeed. Mm-hmm. You have Duke pretty much for as long as, like, maybe two more years, as mm-hmm. far as before you got to really sign him to a contract that he's going to want. You got both right. of these kids for four years if you want them. Mm-hmm. And on, on a very controllable deal, fourth and sixth round picks, they don't make very much. Right. So from a financial aspect, I think you're going to keep both of them in that respect. However, the reverse might happen. They may put Davis on the active and put Hodges on the practice squad because he was a later mm-hmm. draft pick. Mm-hmm. And um, But the unfortunate thing about that is got to cut him to put him on the practice squad. And yeah, you got to wave him. You subject I, him. Yeah, right? I don't, wave. Yeah, wave. I, and I don't think, uh, you know, guys would – I think guys would jump at that. I mean, I think a lot of people now look at the Bills like, wait, you know, what did they see that we missed? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it wasn't like that before. So right. Um, I think if if you put Hodges on the pre- – I would want Hodges on the roster, and I would want Davis on the roster. If you put – Davis on the roster, Hodges on the practice squad, and you cut Duke. The allure of Duke, of someone wanting to claim Duke or sign Duke, even after could you could slide play, Hodges. You could slide yeah. Hodges in there to sneak him right. in. I, that's yeah, what I, I think. Yeah, I agree with you there. You know, um, I I wasn't the biggest fan of Duke Williams when he was on the field because yeah. they, they didn't ask him to do a lot, right? No. Um, but, you know, 
I think what Duke does better than both of these guys is he's just simply more physical. So yes. I guess it's kind of a, if you're looking at what player is going to fit best on the roster, it's really going to depend on, on ultimately what they're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of dynamic of a player are they, are they really looking for? Are they looking for a player who's going to be really physical downfield? Well, that's going to be Duke. He's not going to get set. He's not going to beat anybody with this speed. No. Um, you know, he's going to have to be really physical downfield in own order to be effective, but you know, he had 19 targets and 12 receptions. So in such a small sample size, that's concerning to me, right? Cause it's, that's, that's, you know, yeah. you're not really, you're not doing that great from, you know, from a catch radius standpoint, um, you know, like I wanted to see better production there, you know, 19 targets, 15 receptions. I'd be, that's, that's fine. You know, you, that I'm okay with that, but 19 reception or 19 targets, 12 receptions. I'm a little dicey on, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, Hodges is more physical than Duke downfield. So if it's about physicality downfield, Duke gets the advantage. Yes. Uh, is Davis a more physical player than Duke Williams? I think Duke Williams is a more physical player, but Davis has, Davis reminds me a lot of, um, re remember when we went to training camp, we saw Anquan Bolden. Yeah. Um, and you want to talk about somebody who was really aggressive with their hands at the line. Anquan Bolden was an expert at He's that. He's amazing. I'm not, and I'm not saying Davis is Anquan Bolden, but compared to Duke Williams, Davis might be Anquan Bolt because um, he's just he's so aggressive with his hands at the line. And that's why another thing that I think makes Davis get a little bit more in an edge on these other players is he's going to he's going to do really well against press corners. Um, that's huge. Where, whereas I think Duke and Hodges kind of get a little caught up. Duke's just not really fast enough to generate a ton of that separation underneath. Um, and Hodges is just a little bit slimmer. Um, and I, I just don't think he's got the, I, I just well, don't think yet. he's got the strength, yeah, you know, to, to keep up with press early. Yeah. I, I just think that you know, that's why you draft the guy in the sixth round and you put yeah. him on your team and you want to yeah. develop him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's something very intriguing about him. Now, the one thing that's very intriguing about him is that he catches everything. Davis yeah. too. But Davis seems like more further along as you're explaining it is that his hand fighting at the, at the line is a little bit more polished than, yeah. than Hodges is right now. I right. just like the quick twitch reaction that even though, Hodges doesn't have long speed. He can get open in a small space, which is what this offense is predicated on. Right. Um, it, are they all playing the same position? Yeah, all, they're all outside. Yeah, all these outside. guys are okay. all outside receivers. Okay. Yeah, they're I'm, all I'm outside saying, receivers. I'm just saying, if you wanted to mix it up and you want to move guys around, mm -hmm. I just think right. it'd, be, it'd be fascinating. So, Well, and, and let's be realistic about this, Mario. Yeah. This is not this year's problem. No, right? it's not. Davis, no. Hodges, and Duke Williams are not this year's problem there you know because you still have two more years on brown and beasley yep. right and you got four on digs so there's no rush here right this is an investment in let's see what we can make happen right this is a smart investment you want to get ahead of those wide receiver position changes get because it takes so long for wide receivers to to mature as an nfl route runner this is what smart teams do is you draft when you don't need it right mm -hmm. let's get mm -hmm. ahead this these are positions that require some some culture these are positions that require some time on task the bills are huge in time on task yes. um so these are these are guys that are going to need that th those thousand snaps in practice to learn how to adjust uh you know to running routes at an nfl level and if they can get two seasons before they're truthfully being depended on um that's that's a that's a monster boost uh for their career as far as an impact when they actually do get on the field but I don't think we're going to be seeing their names very often this year. People might look at it and say, well, these picks were kind of a waste. Um, I, it takes a couple of years for receivers to develop. Um, no I'm question. very okay with this. I'm very okay with it. Yeah, I'm just I'm interested to see that in uh, 2022, could mm -hmm. we see Davis and Hodges on the outside and yeah. Diggs in the slot? Yeah, it's no more it's it's no more Mighty Mouse team. I'll tell you what, because these boys <laughs> they're big boys. <laughs> All right, yo, leave a uh, leave a comment um, on this video. Uh, let's see who's on Team Hodges, and let's see who's on Team Wrong. I mean Davis. Um, oh. <laughs>